Hello, I am so, so excited about this video. So we are doing the official Good Omens TV show review. In the past few weeks, I have been reviewing the book, but now I figured for November, I wanted to review the TV show. And who better to review this with than my mother? Hello. You can tell we're <laughs> twins. She's been in videos before. It's been kind of a long time, it's been a while. I think. Yeah. So at least yeah. 2020, I think. Think the last yeah. time so much has changed since then but I really felt like because we've been watching the show together yeah it makes the most sense that we should be reviewing this together so just to kind of give a like little idea of what this is going to be this is going to be kind of an episode by episode breakdown in the style of race chaser with Alaska and Willem or even I'm 40% podcast with Jinx Monsoon and Nick Sahoya. I am going to continue the theme of calling this gay omens um, because really that's what we're watching for. We're watching for the gay. We really we're watching are. for Aziraphale and Crowley. Yeah, and, and their love story. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so like, that's kind of how I want this to go. So we're gonna start with season one, go episode by episode, week by week. So this is episode one, which is entitled In the Beginning. This premiered, I believe in like May of 2019, I wanna say say obviously at this time all the episodes dropped at once because it is amazon this is a jam-packed episode a lot happens in this episode yes we get the scene in eden which is kind of like the prologue in the book but we also yes. get following that like the first chapter of the book in which a lot of things happen in the first chapter as well i didn't remember that and you've never read the book no i don't read <laughs> So you're like Crowley in that sense, because he says he doesn't read. <laughs> so of course this episode starts out with the cold open, which is the narration where God is talking about Armageddon and also the beginning of the world. I absolutely love that God is voiced by Frances McDormand. Most famously, you'll probably know her. I know she was in Fargo. I never saw that, sorry. But I know her from Madeline, Madeline, which I saw when I was a kid, yeah. and also Something's Gotta Give, Something's which gotta I give, she think I saw when I was like a teenager. Yeah. Definitely like an old, not older, but like a, a romance for older people, let's say. <laughs> so me. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Okay. I love you. No, but it's it's funny because I absolutely love her. I love that she's the voice of God. I think that's so iconic. There's not a lot of American actors that are in this show, but there are a select few. And she's one of them. And of course, Gabriel being played by John Hamm is one of them. So technically the earth was born as it were October 21st, which means we just passed her birthday, which is so funny. I love the idea that Earth is a Libra. I don't know enough about astrology to like know if that's accurate or not. I know Libras are considered the scales. Is that not right? Yes, Libra is. Yeah, the it's even So it tempers. kind of makes sense because the whole Crowley and Aziraphale dynamic. Yeah, yeah but that's specifically evil, about Earth but though. It's Oh, yeah, that's true. I don't know. I don't know. I see, I only know enough about my own astrology and I know I'm right on the cusp of Virgo Libra, but I've never had any Libra traits. I know a door is a Libra, whatever that tells you. <laughs> <laughs> that whole part confused yeah. me about the dinosaurs. Yeah, so there's a line in there where God says that the dino the earth is actually 4,000, or no, no, 6,000 years old. So mm -hmm. the bit about the dinosaurs is a joke that the paleontologists haven't seen yet. Yeah. That is a direct line from the book. I don't think it really means anything. I don't know what the joke should be. I think it's kind of like the idea of like, well, God just has a sense of humor. So she just put fake fossils there for no reason. I will say it's, it's a funny line, but given everything about how people who are creationists kind of believe in the world, yeah, it, it feels a little, but <laughs> you know, I, I get it. I do love the addition of like the Tadfield advertiser and the little horoscope. I think that's so cute. Um, I especially love the note that a friend is important to you and help will come from an unexpected quarter. Yes. Because of course that is, I think, referencing Crowley and Aziraphale and how they are going to help save the world in an unexpected way. Yes, yes. Do we know the whole idea? I mean, I love the whole scene of the Adam and Eve, but was there a flaming sword? So actually fun fact, yes. So from what I understand from the Bible, and again, been a long time, hello. Um, it's been a long time, but as I understand the real flaming sword, so there is kind of some speculation, right? That the flaming sword was actually, the sword itself was the angel of the Eastern gate. 
and that it was oh, meant to okay. actually be used to kick Adam and Eve out of Eden. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this reversal in which it's now being used to protect Adam and Eve. And actually, it's funny because I was getting into that because we go to Eden next, we meet Adam and Eve, and then with no, we get to see Crowley as a snake for the first time. I wish we got some more time with Crowley as a snake because I think he's so adorable. I love snakes. I'm kind of doing a homage to Snake Crowley. I've got the black and red, which is kind of very much his signifiers. Again, I just, I love snakes. I always have. And there is actually a snake that Crowley's snake form is based on. I think it's called a red-bellied Australian yeah. something snake. Yes. Just absolutely adorable. It has black eyes, that's the only difference, but otherwise so, so adorable. And I just love that kind of iteration of him. I am very curious who they got to voice Crowley as a snake because it doesn't sound like David Tennant to me. When you hear him like whispering, yeah, I don't know who that is, but it to me it doesn't sound like David Tennant. Maybe it is, maybe they just got him to kind of whisper and yeah, I don't know. And it kind of changes their voice when they yeah. whisper maybe. Yeah. And maybe they wanted it to be like kind of a different effect. But as she will no doubt tell you, when he comes up from the ground and turns into <laughs> a human. Hello, long hair. <laughs> I'm like, hello. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually did put that in notes that every Pause. time we see, yeah, every time we put a pin in that, every time we see human Crowley for the first time, you always say yowza. Actually, the last time you said something different this last time. What did I you say? I was like, know. holy shit or something like that. Something you were like really, that. and you know what? He is very handsome. I can admit that. So mm -hmm. like, I love, but mm -hmm. I love long hair Crowley. I think that's a good look. Yeah. He pulls it off very well. Yeah. I do love the change in the show to give him red hair instead of it is just described as dark hair in mm -hmm. the book mm -hmm. so it kind of could be anything and I know Neil's kind of gotten away with that I also love that if you look if you look it up his exact hair color is actually 66 comma 6 so <laughs> I think it's fitting I think that's probably why they did it to be honest because I think yeah. that's such a funny joke yes that his yes. hair color is exactly 666 and then of course you know we get Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden Adam is given the flaming sword by Aziraphale, and that's kind of the first moment that we get in which he is kind of disobeying heaven. He's disobeying his orders. You know, he was supposed to be the guardian, but he's more interested in guarding humans. And I think that's more enjoyable, to be honest. Yes. It's a more interesting story yes. that he wants to guard them yes. rather than using it to kick them out, which yeah. is kind of what he's meant to do. And he does still do that, sort of, but... He kind of, like, not kicks them out, but... Ushers them. them out. Yes. Like, and says, you need to this go, will protect but yes, you. exactly. You know, and like what he says, you know, she's expecting, and you could see that soft... Baby uh, bump. Well, yeah. Oh. But I meant, of course, Aziraphale being an angel and everything, mm -hmm. that he... It's that softer, more human side of him. Correct. Yeah, it's the side. You. Yeah, <laughs> it's the side that cares about humanity from the very beginning, and that's yes. why we fall yes. in love with him. Yes. And then we get to meet, like I said, we meet uh, Aziraphale and Crowley for the first time. Yes. At this point, Crowley is known as Crawley, but we see he doesn't really care for that name. I think actually in the, even in the prologue, as far back as the prologue, they mention that he really doesn't feel like it's him. It doesn't suit him. And so, you know, he kind of changes his name. A lot of people have talked about how that feels very transcoded because he chooses his name. You know, yes. he gets to make that decision yes. for himself. Yes. And I really like that. I never somehow didn't think about that when I was originally talking about all of this in the book. Yeah. But yeah, so I did find that. I really enjoy that. I like that little yeah. kind of transcoded moment there. Yeah. I do love their kind of introduction and how they first meet. And it's like this little meet cute and their little conversation. And Aziraphale is very worried that he's done the wrong thing. Yes. And I love how relieved he is when Crowley is like, you can't do the wrong thing. You're an angel. And I know you thought that was kind of a sarcastic moment. Yeah. But I think it was meant to be genuine. And yeah. Aziraphale takes such genuine comfort from that. And so it's clear from the beginning, like they very clearly trust each other from the beginning, despite the fact that he's a demon and Aziraphale is an angel, like he still very much trusts him. And you can see as everything progresses that Aziraphale stops himself many times and yeah. says, wait, wait, you know, yeah. you're a demon, I'm a Yeah, it's like he I'm has to angel. remind himself, Correct. I think, sometimes. Because they have such a good back and forth yeah, yeah. that they forget sometimes that, that they're on opposite sides correct. yeah and that's correct. something that comes up a lot throughout the show and it's that's one of the other major differences between the show and the book is i think in the book 
Aziraphale really kind of seems to have already come to the conclusion of like, Heaven doesn't really give a shit about him. And he can kind of get away with it because Heaven really isn't the threat in the book that it is in the show. And Neil even said that, you know, the angels coming to be a bigger part of the show, the other angels, didn't really happen in the book. It was meant to happen in the sequel book, which of course we see now that's going to be season three and that's what they've been building to. But originally, like in the first, in the actual novel, they weren't as big of a feature. And so, you know, Aziraphale kind of has free reign to do whatever he wants. I absolutely, of course, I love the scene where Aziraphale covers Crowley with his wing before it rains. And I love that someone asked Neil why he did that. And Neil's response was so perfect because he's just like, he would have gotten wet otherwise. <laughs> I that's accurate, what I love about accurate. Neil is because yeah. he's so like yeah like what do you it, but it is a very cute moment it feels like a very tender moment especially because Crowley kind of scooches in closer to him and so it's kind of that very first like it's a trusting moment really yes you know yes. he does Aziraphale does that without thinking and then yes. of course we see that mirrored in season two but we're not going to get there because that's a spoiler but we will be reviewing all of that but we're not going to get there now but it's kind of hard to like talk about these things when you have the knowledge of what's to come. Like yes. you can't not acknowledge those things. Like yeah. it's just gonna come up throughout this review. I can't do anything about that, sorry. And then we get the very first iteration of the intro. I love this almost like animated, stop motion-y, paper <laughs> doll type of intro. Yeah. I really think this is cute. This is also the first time we get to hear the intro theme, which originally was supposed to be Every Day by Buddy Holly. That is actually written into the script book, which I thought was very interesting. So Neil was like kind of committed to this idea. I'm glad though, that it is this other theme. I really, really enjoy it. I like how they have managed to write it into other scenes and other moments. I love how they have like the kind of queen inspired version at the end of each episode. I love that when they go to different places, the theme song kind of has little changes. So like when they're in Scotland, it has little bagpipes. I couldn't think of the word. I, couldn't think of the word I know, I was, I was like, like, I know what she's trying to say. You know, this, <laughs> this, whatever this is, bagpipes. <laughs> I love that. I love like all those little touches and fingers crossed, right? Let's hope videos like this will get them to realize people are interested. So keep watching, keep liking, keep commenting, because that's how we get a season three, folks. Obviously Prime knows about me. <laughs> how could they not? <laughs> I love how in the first season, and they only really do it in the first season, where the demons like come up from the earth and there's like that kind of burst of earth as they come up. So Haster and Ligger come up and they're kind of pacing the little graveyard to give Crowley the Antichrist. It kind of follows really beat by beat pretty well, I would say. So anyone who's like very into like, you know, this should be accurate to, this, to the book, to the source material. I think this is probably the most is it? accurate of a lot of things. But also I think it helps that like 50% of the authors who wrote the book wrote the show. Yeah. And the thing that I like is every time, you know, you read books, you have these ideas <laughs> of your imagination on how, if it was a movie or a show, yeah. how it would play out. Yeah. So it's cool in that effect mm -hmm. when it is, when the book becomes a show yeah. and you could see and like the little touches of when he's, you know, I'm not a smoker, but when he when lights he's lighting up that cigarette, cigarette and his hand is on fire. Cool. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. When Crowley signs the paper. And, and there's he, that little... Yeah, and then he's like... Ow. Yeah, there's like a little they burn. have a little bit of a... <laughs> yeah, well, it's like hellfire. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> and hellfire. And it's like, wait, why is it hurt you? Well, you know what's so funny about that scene? So in the, in the book, when he is signing it, he originally tries to sign it, Anthony J. Crowley, and they're like, no, you have to use your real name. And so they make him sign with his sigil, which is what you see in the flame. Okay. And so I think that's interesting. Again, it's a little moment that was cut out that probably, I, I don't think it changes anything, but it kind of just adds to this idea of him as like more of a human, yeah. more of someone who has been changed by his life on earth for the better and become less like his fellow demons and more, you know, just human. human. And I think that's interesting. And I think that throughout the seasons, you see that between the two of them and their friendship, even though yeah. they go back and forth. We're not friends, we can't be friends. Well, that's more of a Xerophel who does that. Yeah, but, but what Crowley continues to say, and it's true, is that we're different. Yeah. 
you know, we're different. You're we're not different like than them. heaven. Yeah. You're, I'm different than hell. Yeah. We're us. Yeah. I think what really makes the difference and the, and if you watch the show more, what I've noticed is, you know, the more we've watched it kind of back and forth and, you know, going back between the two seasons, what I've noticed is I think a lot of the reason Aziraphale pushes back isn't so much what he thinks heaven will do. It seems he says a lot of the times what hell will do to Crowley because he's more concerned very that they would do worse to him. Even though in the book he does explicitly say, whatever hell would do to you, heaven would do the same thing to me. So he knows, at least in the book version, what heaven is like. But in the show, I think he's a little more concerned with what would happen to Crowley than he is necessarily with what would happen to him. Yeah. And I think that's why he pushes away because he's afraid that if they get too close, that it could be or will be dangerous for Crowley. And it does end up being dangerous for both of them, ultimately. What I smaller. like so much about this show is the way... Neil Gaiman shows us that there's a lot of similarities, yeah. good and bad, in both places. Yeah, yeah. It's not we as black and white not as, as black and white. they would like and to And you believe. have to stop and go, that sounds accurate. Yeah, yeah. Because we all have our different belief systems. Mm -hmm. And I always taught her when she was younger, you always respect other people's beliefs. Yeah. And nothing should be black and white. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I like the idea that it's kind of like heaven and hell are kind of two sides of the same coin. coin. Throughout the conversations between some of them from heaven and hell, I'm like, what? what's that? What do you mean? If, you know, when she wants to, uh, Michael, Michael has the relationship with someone in hell and it's like. Yeah. When she's giving information to Ligger yes. about Crowley. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we get to that episode. Okay. But yeah, it's, it's very clear that everyone's kind of doing what they want. They're working on the back channels, as she says. Yes. You know, it's very much like everybody's in it for themselves. And we see that more with Michael and Heaven yeah. in season two, which again, we'll get to that when we get yeah. there. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, yeah. So in this scene as I was saying back to where we were with like um still like the first 10 minutes of the episode oh my god <laughs> exactly this is where we kind of get to see Crowley properly no longer Crawley you know he changed his name much to the consternation of his fellow demons it seems like yes I love the inclusion of Bohemian Rhapsody on this obviously yes. Queen plays a big part in the book and I love that they really got it to continue in the show I think Bohemian Rhapsody was kind of a perfect choice because you get the line about Beelzebub and then the line about the devil, which I think is yes. hilarious and perfect. And they both fit very, very well. So I love that inclusion. Yes. And then again, we see slightly shorter hair Crowley, but still long hair Crowley. I kind of feel like he's giving like an aged rock star vibe. To me, it's a little bit of Mick Jagger. I don't, what do you think? I get what you're saying, yeah. Because it's very absolutely. like the kind of like swaggery vibe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything about Mick Jagger, but it kind of gives, it's that, it's the essence, if okay. you will. Essence. Because I don't think it's as much, it's not Freddie Mercury, I wouldn't say. No. But it's not aesthetically anyway, but it's definitely that kind of like rock star vibe. Exactly. I also love that this is kind of a moment where we get to see more of like the sloth side of Crowley, because I've kind of said before that I think a lot of the main characters kind of give you the seven deadly sins. And I feel like Crowley's is definitely sloth. And this is exemplified by the whole element of like his great demonic deed is that he took down the cell phone towers in London, <laughs> which, you know, I, I he, he is right. That would piss a lot of people off and it ends up coming oh, to absolutely. bite him in the ass, yes. like not 20 minutes later, <laughs> but <laughs> it is something that like on the scale of demonic activity it's pretty low level yeah but i think it's kind of clever yeah. you know and it, it points to again the more human side of his character he doesn't want to do anything too severe that's really going to harm people he just wants to kind of annoy them and be yeah you know kind of just a little silly a little you know a little uh, but i like how the other two are trickster. like you know, I whispered in the ear of a politician. Yeah, or a, a preacher. Or take that bribe. Or yeah, the preacher, yeah. and you're like, that's, but it's so old so school, too. Which he, yeah, which Crowley <laughs> says. Well, what I love is in the book, one of Crowley's big things that he does 
is he likes to glue coins to the ground. Yeah. To like try and get people to pick. I wish that had been in the show because I think that's such a funny concept because it's more like trickster antics of like a teenager than yeah. it is like a 6,000 year old demon. Like just gluing pennies to the floor to watch people struggle well, to pick what them about, up. What about someone who has like a $20 bill yeah, on a string? Yeah, on a string, yeah. And just that's so very it. Bart Simpson of him. It, but it's, <laughs> it's cute and it's yeah. very like, again, it's very human. Yeah. It kind of proves that he's not trying to really hurt anyone. He's yeah. just kind of being a little merry prankster. He's yeah. a little, you know, yeah. And then of course he gets the Antichrist who's in a little picnic basket, which <laughs> is adorable. You know what's almost. funny is I noticed in this first episode, there are a couple of different moments that are like homages to the Wizard of Oz. That is one of them. We'll get to another one where Pepper is kind of dressed very much like the Wicked Witch of the East. Oh, so yeah. I've noticed there's like these few little moments that feel like they're little homages to the Wizard of Oz. I don't know if that was intentional or what exactly that was, but I just realized, you know, the baby in the picnic basket is like another little, like Toto. <laughs> Yeah. Which I guess makes uh, Crowley Miss Gulch, which is... <laughs> God, I'm hotter than hell. Ding! <laughs> oh my God. You're so silly. But I have to say this one part. <clears throat> what I did love, and oh, I've is never dead. seen it on any show, is when you're doing a show where you have a lot of back and forth and going past to present, that they have that cute little way where the it's signs, either, the yeah. signs. Where it either tells it's on you what string. time it is. Yeah. 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 Present day. I do really like that. Five and months ago. Yeah. Because I, that way you can follow it a lot. Yeah. A yeah. lot of times shows don't do that. No. And, and to have that, you're like, oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah. I do really enjoy that. I do enjoy that we kind of get to see where in, where in time we are, where especially time. because this is a show that, you know, it's encompassing 6,000 years and it's dead. <laughs> it's encompassing we'll 6,000 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously mm -hmm. you have to include 6,000 years worth of, you know, information basically. Yeah. To your point there is, you know, this is a season, it, it follows the book in the sense that like, the episodes jump around a lot between yes. different yes. concepts. So, you know, one minute it's like showing Crowley driving the baby to the hospital. The next minute we skip to a zero fail. The next moment we're back to the hospital, but now it's the youngs. Yes. So there's all these kind of moments where it's jumping about, which I think works for television. And certainly it was a little jarring in the book, I'll say that, but it works for television and works for films, things like that. So in this first bit here, while he's driving the Antichrist, we get to see the kind of introduction to the idea that Crowley created the M25, which is probably one of the biggest accomplishments that he has as far as like sins that he actually did. I think it's so funny. We get to see more of it later in the book, or not later in the book, I'm so sorry, later in the show. In the book, we kind of get everything up front about that whole scene. Oh, yeah. But I do, I do actually like the scene in episode six where they actually show 70s Crowley introducing the M25 and that yeah. whole, yeah. can I get a wahoo? I think that's so <laughs> fucking funny. And then wahoo. Haster's like, what's a computer? I just, <laughs> I love all of that. Which I guess in the 70s was a fair question because I don't know that many people in the 70s really knew about computers. That's more your error. Thank you. <laughs> As I indicated to you, my first computer job was in 19... <coughs> <laughs> And uh, back in my day, <laughs> exactly. The screen was still black and the green, the green, <laughs> the green dot matrix printers. <laughs> it took uh, up a whole city full block. Floppy disks, you insert. Yeah, you're ancient. Anyway, oh I God. will say that I do love the cell phones that they have up in heaven. Oh, yeah, they the look pure all clear glass, and they yeah. just go. When yeah. they end the call. Yeah, the angel phones. I think we're going to get there. I, I hope so. I do. I really hope so. I would love to blow on a phone to end a call. I think that'd be very dramatic. Like, yeah. no, I'm tired of you. I'm blowing a phone right now. <laughs> oh, that sounds like something exactly. totally different. That's why oh I was saying. God. I want to be there. You're so too you much. Say, what are you doing blowing my phone? <laughs> I hate you. Thank I'm you. Just kidding. Um, I love that. <laughs> I love that. 
when Crowley gets his instructions from the radio, which of course is something from the book. It's supposed to be in the voice of Freddie Mercury. It's supposed to be in the voice of Freddie Mercury when he gets the instructions. And I love that it kind of like is almost like a smoky thing. And then he almost gets into an accident, which I find really interesting because I feel like it's sort of implied that the Bentley definitely has a mind of its own, or at least oh, yeah. that seems to be the fan consensus. Yeah. So it is- I agree as a fan. Yeah. Yeah. So it is kind of funny that he like nearly gets into an accident because he's so like, you know, being inundated with the information. One of the things I love about this show is a lot of things feel camp in the best possible way. Best possible And way. I know that that word is overused a lot and I know it's often used incorrectly a lot. Yes. I feel that Neil trusts them enough yeah. that it makes it more authentic to yes, me. Yes, yes. Well, the other thing we've talked about too, or we've talked about, you know, not in front of a camera, is how David and Michael have a very clear chemistry. Yes. That's evident from the minute they're on set together and according to Neil was evident within 30 minutes of the table read, Absolutely. even though they'd never worked together before, which is incredible and not very common. People but can fake it. But when it is common, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's undeniable. It, thank you. <laughs> undeniable. <laughs> it's like yeah. they, you, you'd read something that would say, well, this actor was originally supposed to play in a show that two other actors are playing and you're yeah. like, I can't imagine well, you know what's another funny. two people. Well, you know what's funny is I do have a plan for a video, but we can still talk about it here, yeah. where I wanted to talk about some of the original casting choices because when there was an original script oh, in 1992, said. Crowley said. was originally going to be Johnny Depp and Robin Williams was supposed to be tasked as Aziraphale, which would have been a totally different film. Not that it wouldn't be good. A, good in because its they're own both right. Yeah, well, exactly. We're not going to talk about Johnny Depp. But, but Robin Williams was a great uh, actor. Yes, I enjoyed yes. everything he did. But, but it would have been very, very different. And I don't think it would have been. And it's hard to as try good. to. Exactly. And it's hard to picture yeah. certain actors when they say that after the fact. Well, and also you think about the fact of like, you know, 1992 was a very, very different time. I don't know that we would have gotten the story that we have, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. This story came out, or this version came out in 2019. Yes. In which I think queer stories were more welcomed and more accepted and more, you know, readily available. Really the only one in 92, I think that's when Will and Grace had started. So yes. it was- Or near that time. Yeah, 92, 93. Yeah. So it was not as common. And so I don't know that we really would have gotten the same story mm -hmm. from that version of Good Omens than what we're getting now. So I'm kind of glad that it never worked out before because yes. we would not be sitting here having this conversation had it been those previous you know, Correct. iterations. Correct. I know originally Michael Sheen was supposed to play Crowley, which I think is interesting. Neil has said he thinks his Crowley would have been a lot darker, which, is an interesting take, but I'm glad that it turned out the way it did. And yeah, I know they same. said in one of the earlier iterations as well, uh, Aziraphale would have been played by Hugh Grant, which I do, f I can't see it myself. Mm -mm. I think it would have been like, again, it's a totally different movie. There's a moment where Crowley and Aziraphale are sitting on a park bench, um, watching Warlock at like 10, almost 11 being kind of a little asshole. And they're just arguing back and forth about Aziraphale wanting to do a magic show. And it's just, it's that very clear, like an old married couple where they just kind of bicker back and forth and they're just kind of ridiculous. Yes. You know, that's the energy that these two give of like just two people who have been married for like 30 years. Correct. And amused by each other, but also like, oh my God, this again, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's how it reads. It doesn't read like, oh, I'm actually annoyed with you. It's and almost it's, like- And it's almost like they go back to where Aziraphale will go, no, you know, I'm good, we yeah, win, yeah, yeah. you're the demon, yeah. you're bad, you yeah. lose type of thing. Yeah. But you can see moments where it slips out that he clearly lets himself be a little more, I don't wanna say vulnerable, but he lets himself be a little more honest with how he feels. Yes. But it's, it's very much kind of like, <laughs> their relationship I would argue is like, two steps forward, 10 steps back. Yes. And that is certainly evidenced by the end of season two, but we will get there, don't mm. you worry. Mm. Yeah, another planet, uh, Alpha Centauri, which someone pointed out that I didn't even think about. Or is that a star? 
It is a, well, yeah, technically it's a star. Well, what's funny is Alpha Centauri is of course the two initials of Xerophil and Crowley. Oh yeah. But they are also twin stars that orbit each other and often are mistaken for one star from Earth. Oh. Which is of course, I think them in a nutshell is Xerophil and Crowley. Ding, ding, ding. I know. Yeah. So where we are in the episode, by the way, is we're at the scene where we see Aziraphale in the sushi restaurant. Um, it's another moment where we get to see Aziraphale kind of being more human. Yes. I think it's a very cute moment. And again, you know, it's like he's gone there so much that the, you know, chef knows him by name. Yes. Which I think, again, it's that very cute, you know, moment. And then of course he's interrupted while eating by Gabriel, who is his usual prick self. Well, they look down on him. They do. Absolutely. Because he's you know, a little more human. He cares about humanity. And I think they view humanity as just kind of like the way some people view farm animals. Yeah. It's like, you know, maybe an amusing novelty at most, but nothing that they should concern themselves with. Correct. And that's evidence throughout the series. And, you know, the more we get to see. Can I point out something? Not only do they do the celestial thing in the heaven, but they also make it rich versus poor in the way that they're so dressed so nice and neatly and then in hell they're dirty and yeah. scummy yeah. It's, and it's very and much a when she says that line how do i get 10 million demons to go back to work yeah it's very much a it's very mm -hmm. much class system yeah. caste system yeah where you know well you were kicked out of heaven so now you get to be in the shithole, in the basement, in... And yeah, that is something interesting that I didn't even, like, really think about. And that is true. And so they're kind of, you know, they're always dealing with the fact that the roof is leaking or pipes are leaking everywhere. Their office is disheveled yeah. and always behind and everything. Yeah. Whereas Heaven has the angel phones, when they're calling hell, when Michael is calling hell, Ligger has a physical little... You know, phone old school the... phone with the <laughs> twisty wires. What's that called? I guess it, that is considered a princess phone, but I don't consider it a princess phone. <laughs> well, it's almost like they're on a, a landline. Landline. Well, yeah, but I was a thinking hellish of, landline. a payphone. Yeah, almost. well, it might as well be. <laughs> well, that's what's funny is we do see that scene as well where Crowley, getting a little bit back to where we were, yeah. Crowley is on a payphone. But that's probably one of the does... last ones in London. Well, that's. The... <laughs> That's what he does when he realizes. When he yeah, when he realizes he, he fucked up and knocked down the la the <laughs> cell phone towers, and he's like, "Damn it, I fucked myself over," which you know I think is very funny as yeah. well. So in this scene, you know, we see Gabriel notify Aziraphale that the demon Crowley has. I love how he says it like it's a question. He's like, "The demon Crowley, Crowley has uh, got the Antichrist, and he's delivering the Antichrist to mm -hmm. the convent." And then, of course, you know. Aziraphale says, yeah, I've been here since the beginning. And Gabriel's like, so is Crowley. It's really strange you two haven't run into each other yet. And Aziraphale's like, mm -hmm, yeah, no, never met him before. Never met who, him before. Who are we talking about? I'm not, I don't know who that is. Girl, okay. But I mean, it also goes back to the way Gabriel's talking about it. He doesn't realize Well, because Heaven doesn't Earth, know yet. Yeah, but... That they've run into each other. No, I understand. Oh. But I'm talking about he's acting like how you haven't run into each other... There's millions of people on well, Earth. Well, now, not but at the I mean, time. Yeah, but he's probably thinking about like heaven oh. where when everything started, there was only Adam and Eve and yeah, then yeah, yeah. everything Absolutely. came from them. So then, of course, we cut to the scene where we meet Deirdre and Arthur Young who yes. are unexpectedly giving birth. I, I'm guessing Deirdre was going into labor early because yeah, the nuns said, are surprised. You're not supposed to be here till... Next week or tomorrow or something, something. Yeah, a couple more weeks. Yeah. So, of course, you know, it's a lot of different factors that went into why the babies get mixed up. And I think it's very well done. I love yes. this whole scene. Yes. You know, I love that in the, you know, we see the convent. I almost said nunnery. We see the <laughs> convent for this uh, Order of St. Beryl, chattering nuns. What I love is they're like, don't let them see anything untoward. And you're like, you're all wearing... The image, like, what are we doing here? You're not really trying to hide it that well. <laughs> like, how are you going to say, don't let them see anything untoward? Like, <laughs> it's everywhere. I don't know. And what is the line where, you know, the chromosomal... Oh, yeah. Blah, blah, y chromosome male, male boy male. son. And, and I, like, you know what's funny is I did make a note of that because I'm like, that is such a, like, you know, toxic masculinity, U.S. man thing that's just like, ugh. 
Ugh. I hate, I get why they included it. It's so, it's funny and stupid, but it's also yeah. so like Predictable. a thing that you're just like, <laughs> bleh, bleh. I think this scene and this whole kind of moment does give like the omen. It also, which of course is what uh, Good Omens was kind of parodying in the beginning. And then of course it also gives a little bit of Rosemary's Baby where there is that kind of like, I think she's an older English woman actually in Rosemary's Baby, who's like her upstairs neighbor, who's yeah. like very kind of yeah. putting everything into motion to make her have give birth to the Antichrist. So it's kind of like both of those. Cause they have that order. Yeah. So it's kind of both of those moments or both of those ideas kind of mixed into one. It's a little bit of Rosemary's Baby, a little bit of The Omen, and a lot of it gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, of course, you know, because they need to make sure that everything can go according to plan. You know, they make Mr. Young stand outside while Deirdre gives birth. And then, of course, you know, we see Crowley. Mr. Young assumes that he's the doctor because he's driving a Bentley, I assume. And he's like, well, they're in room three. You know, we're just kind of getting on with it. So he takes the baby into room three. And then of course, you know, he runs into the nun, Sister Mary Loquacious, who is like, okay, you know, you're telling me to go to room three, even though she should have heard room four. But then she runs into a different nun who never corrects her on what the correct, correct. room number is. Mm -hmm. So it's like two different people weren't fucking paying attention here. Yeah. And yet Crowley has to take the blame, even though he didn't do it. It's not really his fault. The nun's fucked up. And then of course, you know, we have that moment where God is explaining um, how the babies get, you know, transferred around. I think how yeah. you kind of can keep track of them is the original Dowling baby is wearing a blue blanket. Blanket. Adam is wearing a red blanket. Or no, no, no. Excuse me. Burgundy. Not the not the original uh, Dowling baby. The original uh, young young baby is wearing a blue blanket. Mm -hmm. The original Dowling baby is wearing a white blanket, and then Correct. the original Antichrist is wearing the burgundy, burgundy. red blanket. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, we see that. Sister Mary Loquacious brings that baby into the Young's room. The other baby, the Young's original baby, which then becomes a warlock, is moved to the Dowling's. Mm -hmm. And then the Dowling's baby is, we don't really know. It's implied that, that they probably had him out. killed. Oh. Well, they, God said it would be lovely to think that they had him adopted out. They probably weren't going to go to all that trouble. Yeah. It's a yeah. baby. They're a satanic order. It's kind of implied that they don't give a shit. Yeah. So, I mean... If we'd like to think that it's something lovely, we don't know. But it is really interesting that technically the Youngs, so Warlock is technically uh, Deirdre and Arthur Young's actual child. actual child. And then Adam obviously is the Antichrist. One of the nuns, I can't remember her name, I think it's Sister Mary Verbose, who ends up coming back as Maggie in season two. Yeah. She is trying to figure out where the Antichrist is and she goes, Satan, give me strength. And I'm like, I'm gonna start saying that all the time now because I think that's so funny. And then of course, you know, they're trying to figure it out. She runs into Sister Mary Loquacious and there's like that kind of moment where they're winking and having like quiet conversations with each other that and that's hilarious also part of where everything gets all mixed up and again i think this is one of the few moments where Which god's God. narration wink, yeah man i think this is one of the yeah. moments where god's narration makes sense yes. and is appropriate yes but i think it's a little like overused this season and then in the second season it's just totally gone which kind of makes me wonder if they're not implying that somewhere between season one and season two god just dies or goes on vacation. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she just fucked off to somewhere else. She's like, I'm done. Fuck you people. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's an interesting thing that you jump that kind of drastic change. Yeah. And I think most of the time we can argue that things don't just happen for no reason. Well, so but I'd... also maybe they felt that it didn't fit. Like, well, we're yeah, saying but it's such a drastic agree. change. I love that in this scene, of course, you know, they're naming the Antichrist or who they think is the Antichrist. Damien is suggested twice, twice, which I love the, uh, the omen homage. kind of homage. Uh, I don't know where Warlock that came from. Warlock is hilarious because War that's what you call a male witch, right? Yes. Yeah, I do love the name Warlock as the suggestion. I love that the reason they didn't want to go with Damien is because it's too alliterative. Yeah. And then the well, youngest... Well, with their last name. Yeah. 
the youngs didn't want to go with Damien because it's not normal enough, which I think is really funny. So I, I kind of love that they had that little moment of like an homage to the yeah. omen, but then yeah. we're like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. So it's Warlock <laughs> and Adam. And Adam. The actual Antichrist is Adam after Adam and Eve, which I think is adorable. Yeah. And of course, the nuns suggest the name for both babies. Yes. So Sister Mary Loquacious technically is the one who actually names the actual Antichrist. Yes. The other ones just think they name the Antichrist. I love how we're finally now at the scene where Crowley is trying to call Aziraphale on his phone, realizes that the cell phone towers are empty, are dead, so then he has to go and pull over to the side of the road and call him on a pay phone. And I feel like if you're a demon, you don't really need to go through the phone lines. You could just like call him through some kind of magic, but he pulls over. I mean, calls like him they through did the... It, the other ones reached Crowley on the radio. Yeah, exactly. That's how demons connect. And Crowley later calls through the Bentley radio in season two when he's talking to Aziraphale when he realizes that his car is yellow. So <laughs> he can do it. He, he just can. chooses not to. It's kind of that human moment again mm -hmm. that we see kind of throughout the series where mm -hmm. it's little moments of choosing humanity rather than choosing using your kind of demonic influence, yeah. basically. Yeah. So then of course we see Aziraphale and Crowley meeting in St. James Park to discuss the Antichrist and the end of the world. I do love the revelation that all of the major composers that were famous of the last, you know, hundred years or whatever, were all in hell. I think that's really funny. Oh, and so then nice. it's revealed He's in- one of ours. Yeah, exactly. It's revealed in the book that all of the best choreographers are in heaven. So really, truly, gays do get into heaven, I think. Uh, <laughs> and I, but I do think that's funny that, because I think the exact line is, hell has all the best composers, but heaven has all the best choreographers. I just think that's so funny. That is As funny. like a line. And of course, you know, this is a moment where Crowley is telling Aziraphale, like, we have to save the world because if you don't, you're not gonna get to go to restaurants that you love and you're not gonna get to have your yeah. own bookshop. Yeah. And so it's a moment where he's trying to tempt Aziraphale into basically doing the right thing. Like, you know, anytime I think Crowley uses him to his him temptations. And he, <laughs> any, uh, anytime Crowley is actually trying to tempt Aziraphale and trying to use temptation, he's trying to do it in a way that's ultimately for the betterment of the world. Of course. He's not trying to make Aziraphale do anything that would be terrible. No. He just wants to make the world a better place and to save the world ultimately. And I think- From themselves. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately what this scene is. He's trying to tempt Aziraphale with like, you will lose your bookshop if this happens. You'll yes. lose all your favorite music. You'll lose all your favorite food. And so he knows that that's something that's gonna work. And when it kind of doesn't work, he goes, okay, well, let's have lunch. Yeah. It's another Did you notice he just stopped? Yeah. How about crepes? Yeah, exactly. I still it's owe a, you from uh, 17, 8, 1793, the reign of terror. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's again, it's that moment of, you know, tempting him with something he enjoys, which happens to be food. And so we see them for the first time at the Ritz. And of course, it's one of the first moments where we witness Crowley watching Aziraphale eat. Um, <laughs> very clearly something he enjoys doing. But he does say... What do you want to do? Yeah, he wants to drink, drink. alcohol. So they do, they do, they end up drinking, they get drunk. drunk. Uh, I do think it's kind of funny because the idea of an angel and demon being able to get drunk is kind of funny because it's like you'd think they wouldn't actually even be able to, but they do. And, you know, then they're having this conversation very drunkenly. It's very hard for them to keep <laughs> track of the conversation. <laughs> and so they're like, okay, we got to sober up. I do enjoy. I the, want to be able to. I mean, sober wouldn't you like want that? to sober up yeah. like oh, that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got to go to work in a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And then the wine fills back up, so you really have just an endless supply That's of almost wine. Gross. Well, That's yeah, almost but I mean, it's gross. coming out of their bloodstream, so it's fine. <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. I don't know where it's coming They're from. They're peeing in a bottle. So, of course, you know, they talk about the end of the world, like I was saying, before they sober up. I do kind of wonder how much of that conversation was improvised because their little back and forths while they're drunk almost feels like it's it almost feels improvised in a good way you know it feels like they're having a natural conversation yeah. about things it yeah. just i don't know you know what i mean does yes. that make sense yes no okay because i, I feel that that happens more than just oh time. yeah yeah and there's there's moments where we do know that they were improvised lines not a lot of them but we do know that you know about the show because neil yeah. has talked about it yeah i love the idea 
that Aziraphale very famously loves musicals. He's very much a fan of Sondheim. I disagree, but that's not the point. But I love that he and Crowley specifically hate the sound of music, but God is apparently a fan of the sound of music. <laughs> so he tells him that. That's yeah, what I like yeah. I, I have to assume that the reason they don't like it is because they lived through World War II, and that's yeah. kind of the primary thing that sound of music is about. So then we get to the point where Aziraphale says he cannot help Crowley in stopping the end of the world as much as he wants to. And again, it's another moment where Crowley is clearly trying to tempt him by saying, okay, well, you know, you can't stop the end of the world because that would be doing, you know, going against the will of the Almighty. But what if you stopped me? You could do that. And then how do you know that stopping me isn't still following the rules? And so it's like, it's using his temptation again to do ultimately what's the best, yes. but it's, it's tempting him. It's doing what he needs to. And I feel like there is kind of a thing where, you know, it seems like Aziraphale kind of will do what he should be doing, but almost needs to be tempted into it a little bit yeah. sometimes. Not all the time. Obviously, giving away the flaming sword was an instance he did not need to be tempted into do the, doing that. Nobody told him to do that. But in general, I would argue that there's a lot of times where he kind of needs to be tempted into it yeah. in order to do what he should do. But he does it in Stop, such a baby. way that he doesn't realize he's being tempted into yeah, it. Yeah, no, exactly. So, or if he does realize it, he's just kind of like, yeah, I'm going to accept that because yeah. it's what needs to be done anyway. And yeah. so he agrees to it. Yeah. Um, I love the line where they talk about being godfathers. I think that's very cute. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Aziraphale goes, well, I'll be damned. And Crowley goes, it's not that bad. Let's get used to it. I think that's such a funny line. I love that to signify their agreement to raise Warlock, uh, they shake hands. So it's kind of that proverbial deal with the devil that Aziraphale is doing <laughs> by shaking Crowley's hand and agreeing to be. And then we get to the moment. Uh, the nanny. Nanny Ash. Ashtoreth, I don't even know how you pronounce it. I've never known how you pronounce it. And they never say her name in the show. They just call her Nanny. I, speaking of the Nanny though, I I love, love, love Nanny's uh, lullaby. If I ever had a child <laughs> that is absolutely the lullaby I'm singing to my kid, I think it's so funny. I love that this is kind of the first scene where we see Crowley and Aziraphale going to heaven and hell respectively. They take an elevator. I love the idea that- It's an that, escalator. Uh, sorry, that's, I'm thinking about the other seasons. <laughs> escalator They take down, the escalator. escalator I love up. the idea that they're both shown in the same thing. So one of them is going up and the other one's going down. I think that's really cool how funny. they did that. But the escalator is kind of like, this is the only time we see it is in this season. Yeah. It turns into an elevator almost exclusively in the next season. And then I guess we won't know what season three is going to do. I yet. like the escalator. Myself. I do. I think it's a clever idea. Mm -hmm. I think it makes a lot of sense. And then of course, you know, we see Crowley in hell. We get to meet Beelzebub for the first time. He talks about Warlock. They ask how he's doing. You know, it's a cute little moment. I like uh, Crowley with the man bun. I, this is supposed to be in, I think by the time this particular element would have taken place, would have been like 2010, 2013, which is really when the man bun invasion took over. So I like that little bit of detail yeah. of like historical yeah. accuracy to something yeah. a little more modern. So, you know, we see Aziraphale going to heaven, which is where we meet the other angels. Besides Gabriel, we meet Michael, Sandalfun, and Uriel. I think it's very interesting because their outfits are very like 1920s, 1930s style suits. You know, they've got the little spats on their shoes. So it's very kind of like old school, almost very gangsterish, I would say, old oh. school gangster, which is very interesting. Um, as opposed to Aziraphale, who even though his style is very like 1880s, it almost feels timeless in a weird way. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's older, but it's still somehow current enough that it works. So I, I think of all the angels, Sandalfin is my least favorite. He's just, something about him is so smarmy and gross and just... Oh, I just I'm don't see like how jewels him. on his teeth. Yeah, or he's got he's got grills. He's the only one technically. Although Crowley does copy that in season two when he does his little angel disguise. Although again, that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. <laughs> um, but yeah, something about him I don't like. And then we cut to that moment 
where Crowley and Aziraphale are on the bus together on the yes. way to their respective homes. Mm -hmm. I do love the idea that Aziraphale has like little reading glasses while he's reading the paper because being an angel, he shouldn't need them. But it's just again, it's that perfect little, twenty twenty. Yeah, vision. but it's that little cute like human moment. It's the moment yes. of like he yes. chooses to have that, just like he chooses yeah. to eat, just like Crowley chooses to sleep. They do all these little things that drink alcohol. are yeah they're <laughs> human things that they don't have to do but they choose to do the next kind of scene is getting introduced to hell i love the please don't lick the wall sign <laughs> i want that on my i want that on my wall in my office <laughs> all of their little demotivational <laughs> posters so that they have great i ones. want them i really yeah. want there's another one that says uh this office has gone zero days without someone saying the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think that one's more in season two, but it's such a funny line that I absolutely, like it's another one I need on my wall in my office because yeah. it's just so stupid and funny. Um, and then of course, you know, we see the hellhound. It's kind of vague in the beginning until he's released, but yes. it's like implied that he's obviously the biggest one they've got. He's a very big dog. I kind of, you know, because of all of the, uh, mythologies around hellhounds and that idea. I kind of wish he'd been like Cerberus, like the three-headed dog in Greek mythology. But sure. I but guess why I guess... is it that he has no eyes or it's their clothes? Well, because he's a he's like a devil dog. He doesn't need to have eyes. He doesn't need to have anything. He's you know he's not a real dog. Okay. Those those teeth though. Ooh. Oh yeah, like two sets of teeth and almost not shark like, but definitely like jagged. Jagged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's such a great build up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I love that Warlock is like such a brat. I love that he wants his birthday in an escape room. I think that's so funny. <laughs> I love the moment where we it's finally like an eleven-year-old wants a party. In well, an I think room. it's kind of like and the, and the mom's like, uh, I've yeah, we can't told do. You yeah, we can't do that. No, we're not doing that. Yeah, I think that is really funny. Um, you know, we get to see Crowley for the first time with short hair in this show. I, you know, I, I always like long hair Crowley better, but I think it's cute. I think it works. Yeah. You know, it's a change in style. His sunglasses also change yes. with this changing in style. It's kind of like another moment where he's sort of adapting with the time because yeah. now it's 2019 and things are a little bit different. Yes. You know, the fashion has gone away from the man bun style and is more of like a closely cropped, you know, kind of casual style, which he adapts. So of course in this scene, it's where Crowley mentions the Hellhound for the first time. Yeah. Um, Aziraphale is very shocked because he didn't know about the Hellhound. I love that he, the references for the possible name for the Hellhound are either Throat Ripper or Stalks by Night, which I assume are references to Jack the Ripper and the Night Stalker. That would yeah. be my guess. It makes sense for Hell to have a Hellhound with like serial killer names as like their kind of ideas of what would of be the, the hellish name you know <clears throat> every, the big huge build-up is what he decides for the name yeah is gonna change everything yeah so he comes up with dog and then all of a sudden dog he's just a little terrier is a little dog yeah and, and you're like really cute. oh it's perfect i think this is the moment in the season when aziraphale and crowley are watching warlock where we first hear crowley call aziraphale angel for the first time yes um which is very cute again like i said that that moment between them their little banter feels like an old married couple yeah. you know crowley is embarrassed that aziraphale wants to do his magic act so that they can go to warlock's party he's like you can do real magic why do you need to do this little like sleight of hand shit and it's i think it's funny again it's this moment of like aziraphale likes the humanity of doing terrible magic even though he can make anything he want appear yeah. or disappear yeah. Yeah. he likes the humanity of it he likes the you know, silliness this, of it. Yeah, the silliness of it, the campiness of it, as it, yeah. as you as it were. It is kind of funny that it, it is kind of funny that they talk about the possibility of killing Warlock, uh, which is probably a good thing that they don't because they have the wrong kids. That'd be very awkward and wouldn't yeah. have changed anything. Yeah. Um, I, I love though that Crowley's like, I'm saying you could kill him. <laughs> like it's it's very like okay, I'm clearly done being subtle about this. You could kill him. Um, and then of course we learn that Aziraphale, unlike his fellow angels, has not killed anyone. Um, which I think is a very interesting kind of moment because it speaks to his humanity. Yeah. It speaks to how much he cares about humanity that yeah. he has never personally killed anyone. Maybe he's been accidentally responsible for it, you know, yeah. in season two, we'll talk about that. But in general, he has not killed someone directly. And I think that's very interesting. But again, yeah, it's the whole aspect of how long they've been on earth. Yeah, exactly. That it, it speaks becomes, to their general humanity. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I like that. I appreciate that. And I do love that when we finally do get to Warlock's birthday, seeing Aziraphale do his little magic act, it's so ridiculous. It's so silly. It's so over the top. And it's so bad. And the kids are just not having it. Those kids are rotted, which, you know, kids rotted. Rot Kid. And no, then it only that. became the best party when there was a food fight. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that changes in the book because you were asking how the food fight yeah. came about. Yeah. Um, in the book, Aziraphale tries to kind of get the security guard into working with him and he tells him to check his pocket because he's got a little handkerchief in there, but it's a lacy handkerchief because he's extra. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, the lace gets caught on his gun and the gun flies into the jello bowl and then that hits uh warlock in the face and warlock grabs the gun and shoots it at crowley and thankfully it turns to water so he doesn't you know get discorporated or anything but it is a funny idea inconvenience too yeah remember? yeah inconveniently <laughs> discorporated and then it's kind Paperwork. of like everyone's jealous because he's got a gun and you know they're trying to wrestle it away from him and then it becomes a food fight and it's just it's this kind of funny moment in the book well one of the things i was going to talk about is when aziraphale and crowley realize they have the wrong kid you know it's funny because aziraphale is covered in cake and crowley's like you're not getting in this fucking car covered in cake so you better fix that which i think is hilarious uh, but he does let him get in the car uh, covered in cake in the show, which is kind of interesting. So, you know, then of course we see Crowley and Aziraphale drinking in the bookshop again. And then we, the, one of my favorite moments, you know, Crowley smells that he's got the hellhound. He's like, something's wrong or something's oh, yeah, different. Yeah. Aziraphale's like, oh, I, you know, tried a new cologne. My barber recommended it. He's like, I know, like, I know what you smell, smell like. like. I was like, oh! I know, right. I know. Again, it's a little, it's a cute little moment. I know what like, you smell like. Oh. <laughs> and Aziraphale's kind of taken aback. He's like, oh. It's like, whoops. Okay, fair enough. And then, of course, you know, there's that line where he's like, you know, I'm not, he's like, of course you would lie. You're a demon. And Crowley's like, well, I'm not lying about this. It's like, after all this time, do you really think he's going to lie to you? I think you have to know. I know he's, you know, he says it because he feels like he has, has to, to yeah. but it's just like, girl, come on, you know, you know where this is. Stop, stop playing these games. That was it. That is the end of the episode. I do certainly hope that you all have enjoyed this. I hope that you will join us next week when we review episode two. Thank you all so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like this video, comment down below, tell us your favorite moment in this episode and of course subscribe to this channel and if you enjoy this channel you can also follow me over on patreon at patreon.com slash that is my exclusive members only channel where i do a little behind the scenes snippet <laughs> and until next time stay devilish and see you next tuesday